Although ischemia and tissue hypoxia usually happen on a small scale, sometimes they can happen diffusely in a catastrophic and very dangerous condition known as shock. This is when systemic blood pressure is so low that the body can't adequately supply oxygen to all its tissues, which can very quickly lead to multi-system organ failure and death. You will definitely see this on the wards, so it's important to know the difference between the two main types of shock. The first type is caused by dangerously low cardiac output, either due to low blood volume, which is called hypovolemic shock, or to a poorly functioning heart, which is called cardiogenic shock. The blood vessels try to compensate for this by clamping down, increasing total peripheral resistance, and shunting blood away from the skin and towards vital organs but it isn't enough. On the other hand, septic shock is caused by massive and uncontrolled peripheral vasodilation. The heart tries to compensate by pumping harder, leading to high cardiac output, but the blood keeps going to the periphery instead of to vital organs, which doesn't help. Even though both of these conditions have life-threateningly low blood pressure, you can easily remember the difference if you just focus on the skin. Cold skin means peripheral vasoconstriction, and hot skin means peripheral vasodilation. Before moving on, let's review what we've covered with a couple of questions. Ready? If a patient is in cardiogenic shock, is the serum lactic acid level likely to be low or high? Here's a hint. When do cells make lactic acid? If you said the lactic acid level will be high, you're right. A patient in shock will have tissue hypoxia, and cell injury all over the body. Since there is not enough oxygen to meet cellular demand, cells will start using anaerobic metabolism, which produces lactic acid. Next, question two. Which vein will have the highest lactic acid level? Internal jugular vein, femoral vein, renal vein, or splenic vein? Which of these tissues will be producing the most lactic acid? If you said femoral vein, you're right. Remember that in cardiogenic shock, blood is diverted away from peripheral tissues toward vital organs. The internal jugular, renal, and splenic veins all drain vital organs, namely the brain, the kidneys, and the spleen. So they will have less lactic acid than the femoral vein, which only drains peripheral tissues. Now before we move on to inflammation, let's quickly talk about atrophy. As you can see, a number of things can cause atrophy. What you need to remember is that atrophy is a reduction in the size or number of cells. It can be normal, like in the case of the uterus and vagina during menopause, or it can be pathologic, like in the case of muscle cell atrophy with motor neuron damage. You need to know all these causes, but there isn't anything complicated about them. Make a note to memorize this, and let's move on to inflammation. Inflammation is a classic topic that's been used to torture medical students, I mean, that's been used to teach medical students, for hundreds of years. In fact, the words we use to describe it are still in Latin. The picture you should have in your head is something like this, which is an acute attack of gout. As you can see, the joint is swollen and red, and even though you can't see it in the picture, it would be very painful, hot to the touch, and impossible to move. Acute inflammation occurs when some precipitating factor triggers a chain of events. The first is fluid exudation, when blood vessels dilate and become leaky, which allows inflammatory cells to get where they're needed quickly, almost like traffic clearing the way for a fire engine to rush to the scene of a fire. Once the fire is put out, fibrosis comes next, when fibroblasts arrive on the scene and lay the groundwork to rebuild, that is, the extracellular matrix. Finally, the last stage is resolution, when permanent repair takes place to patch up the whole area. Initially, this happens very quickly, with lots of new blood vessels and chaotic growth, called granulation tissue. If there wasn't too much damage, the normal architecture of the tissue can be completely restored. Otherwise, there are a few ways for this process to end. The first is an abscess, which you can see here. It's basically a ball of pus that's walled off from the rest of the body by fibrotic tissue. Like the one in this picture, abscesses are common with skin infections, particularly those caused by Staph aureus. One important thing to remember about abscesses is that they don't get good blood flow since they're walled off, so taking antibiotics isn't enough to clear out the bacteria, 
Most abscesses require surgical incision and drainage, known as an I and D, for treatment. The second way that inflammation can resolve is with a fistula, which is an abnormal tract connecting two structures that shouldn't be connected. For example, Crohn's disease can lead to fistula forming between two separate and distant bowel segments or between bowel and non-GI structures, such as the bladder or even the vagina in women. The last and probably most important way that inflammation can resolve is with scarring. Basically, the body sacrifices the function of the normal tissue in order to preserve some of its structure and strength. A great example of this is shown here. This is scarred myocardium after a myocardial infarct. A thick layer of collagen has been laid down, allowing the heart muscle to stay in one piece, which means it can keep beating. But the price is that this chunk of heart muscle is akinetic, meaning that it doesn't contract. One other important distinction when it comes to inflammation is the difference between acute and chronic. Acute inflammation is usually mediated by granulocytes, in this case neutrophils, along with antibodies and complement. It happens very quickly seconds to minutes and doesn't last too long. On the other hand, chronic inflammation is mediated by mononuclear cells, in this case macrophages. Over long periods of time, months to years, the tissue is repeatedly destroyed and rebuilt. With repeated growth of blood vessels and fibrosis, the ultimate result is often a granuloma, which is a nodular collection of epithelioid macrophages and giant cells. We have talked about these already when we talked about caseous necrosis, but here you can see that they are composed of macrophages and giant cells, which are essentially massive macrophages. Before we move on, let's test our understanding with a quick question. How long after a myocardial infarction is the risk for perforation highest? One hour, one week, or one year? Isn't this a cardiology question? Well, maybe, but try to think about it in the context of the inflammatory response. If you said one week, you're right. After one hour, fluid exudation is still going on, but the tissue itself has not been degraded. At one week out, granulation tissue is starting to form, which is weak and poorly organized, so it's susceptible to perforation due to the high pressures in the heart. After an entire year, the process of scarring has been completed, so that even though the tissue doesn't work as well, it is strong and won't perforate. Next, we'll move on to leukocyte extravasation, an important part of the inflammatory response. As you can see, there's a lot of detail here involving specific proteins and cytokines. These are important to know, but let's focus on the process, which really is pretty amazing. I like to call it the roll and squeeze technique. When there's no inflammation, neutrophils and other white blood cells just float along in the blood happily. Some of them happen to be at the edge of the vessel, where they can roll along the surface with protein-protein interactions. When there's inflammation, endothelial cells express certain proteins, like ICAM, that serve as a distress signal, causing the neutrophils to stop rolling at that spot. Once they've stopped, they squeeze out of the blood by moving between endothelial cells in a process called diapedesis. Like I said, roll and squeeze. Now that they're in the interstitial fluid, they follow the trail of bacterial products and a number of cytokines listed here as silk in order to hone in specifically on the problem area. The entire process is really complex and well coordinated and it allows the neutrophils to end up exactly where they need to be. Before we get to learning about the full process of wound healing, let's take a minute to talk about free radical injury. Free radicals are anything that have an unpaired electron, meaning they're super reactive and just itching to attack something. As you can see here, a number of different things can lead to free radical formation, and they can cause a bunch of damage if they're not properly dealt. The body has ways to eliminate free radicals, including enzymes that are important in fighting off bacteria, as well as certain dietary antioxidants, like vitamins. But if these are defective or overwhelmed, then the free radicals are going to cause pretty significant damage. You can memorize the six things on this list if you want, but it's better to think about a couple of common things that can cause free radicals. The first is oxygen. Now I know what you're thinking. We need oxygen to live, so how can it be damaging? Well, 
In normal amounts, it's not that bad. But if we get too much oxygen too fast, it can form free radicals like superoxide, which can wreak havoc. This is actually the cause of number one and number two listed here, both of which happen in premature infants like this who need to be intubated and get very large amounts of oxygen in order to survive. This can lead to both retinopathy of prematurity and bronchopulmonary dysplasia. It also happens with number six, which is typical after MI or stroke due to reperfusion therapy. The other big category you should know is drugs or poisons, including carbon tetrachloride, acetaminophen, and excess iron. 